صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أخلا قال لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك آيات لقوم يتفكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم Sween, you're gathering with a loud remembrance upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Amongst the most memorable times in the lives of many human beings is the engagement period where two individuals are engaged and they look forward to a marriage, the long commitment, the big commitment. It's a period of time where people go out, they have fun, they converse, they spend the best times of their lives together. And it's a period that allows an individual to look forward to the bigger commitment, to spending their entire life with the significant other. However, in the same time, it could be an extremely manipulating period of our lives as well. What do I mean? I recall several years ago when I was in Florida, two people in the center got to know one another. So a couple of weeks later, they came to me and they said, Say it, it's okay. Just listen to me, give me your attention. Don't think about this. It's an interesting story. So they came to me, they said, Say it. We've met each other in the masjid, we've met each other at the Islamic Center, and we'd like to get to know one another. So they began to get to know one another, and a while later, they got engaged. They had a small engagement party, they got engaged. And soon after the engagement, the lady, the sister, 
She came to me and she said, Sayyid, I'd like to tell you something. So I said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What is she going to tell me? She said, Sayyid, you know, this place has allowed me to meet the most beautiful man on earth. He's so generous. He's so kind. He's so humble. He takes care of me. He listens to me. He listens to my concerns. And I feel that this man is not even a human being. He's an angel. So I said, Alhamdulillah. So a couple of weeks after that, the man came and he said, Sayyidna, you know, I'd like to thank you. This place allowed us to get to know one another. And we're spending the best time of our lives together. I said, how come? He said, well, Sayyid, you know, this, this girl, every time I go to their house, she cooks the most delicious meals. And during the weekdays, she takes, she, during the weekends, she takes my shirts, she washes them, irons my shirts, gives it to me on the weekends. She's just so courteous. She makes me feel special. She laughs at my jokes. I really am looking forward to spending my entire life with her. And soon enough, they got married. A couple of months after their marriage, I was visiting California. So I remember I was sitting and I got a phone call from the sister. And uh, I, pick, I, picked up, I picked up the phone. I said, Salaamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salaam. Sayyidna, where are you? I said, I'm in California. I thought, you know, they wanted to invite me to their house. She said, when are you coming back? I said, Thursday. So she said, can we see you on Thursday? I said, you know, it's difficult. Let's put it on Friday. She said, no, Sayyid, if we can see you on Friday. So I said, okay, where? She said, what do you mean where? At the center, in, in the office. So I said, okay, what is this in regards to? She says, Sayyid, now this is, we need some counseling. So I said, okay. So Thursday came and they came to the office and as soon as she walked in, she closed the door behind her. She sat down. I said to her, sister, what's happening? What's going on? And she said, Sayyid, you know, to sum it up in one word, this guy's a devil. I said to her, why? Why would you say that? She said, Sayyid, he expects me to serve him 24-7, wash his shirts, iron his shirts, cook for him, clean for him. I mean, he didn't marry a servant. He married a, his, you know, a wife. He should help in the house as well. So I said, what's going on? What's your story? He said, say it before. When I would say anything, she would laugh at my jokes. She would make me feel special. Now whatever I say is not funny to her. And she doesn't want to do anything. She doesn't want to wash the dishes. She doesn't want to wash my clothes. She doesn't want to iron my shirt. She doesn't want to do anything. So we're having some troubles. And of course, it's not a shocking story. Why? Because it really happens to everyone. Every marriage in the beginning goes through difficulties. Why? Once again, because you're coming out of the engagement period, the period where everybody's speaking to each other politely, with affection, with love. We don't disrespect one another, we're always dressed nice, we always look good, we're always courteous. Then when we're stuck with each other and we have to live together, then slowly but surely, some of those protocols are removed from our list of priorities. So problems occur. And when problems occur, we don't know how to handle them. So some people end up going through troubles and every time there's uh, an argument, every time there's a problem, every, every time there is an issue, there's a gap that's created between the wife and the husband. And sometimes this gap keeps on growing and growing and growing and people live without a peace of mind, without love, without harmony for 40 or 50 years. They live in the same house. But there is no love, there is no respect. They're just living on the, under the same roof. One of those guys who was married for 40 or 50 years on his 50th anniversary went to Jerusalem. So he went to Jerusalem and there his wife died. 
on the 50th anniversary, he went to Jerusalem and his wife died. So they came to him, they said to him, listen, you can choose to send your wife back to California and it's going to cost you $100,000. Or you can choose to bury her in the Holy Land and that's going to cost you $100. So he thought about it and he said, no, I'm going to take her back. They said to him, sir, $100,000, $100. L.A., Holy Land. Why? Why would you spend so much money? Is it because you love her so much? He said, listen, Jesus died here and three days later he was resurrected. So I'm taking her with me. So some people live a lie 40, 50 years of misery. And some others know six months later, a year later, two years later, they end up in a divorce. And you know that the United States of America has the highest numbers of prisoners in the world. And this is definitely not something to be proud of. Surveys indicate that when they go to prisoners, <clears throat> individuals in prison, the majority of them come from broken families, divorced families, single parents. So divorce is a solution. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has definitely put that solution for individuals who are going through, uh, you know, going through difficulties. And they need to save themselves, they need to save their children, they need to sell, save their lives by a divorce. However, it's not something that we should take lightly. And in America, divorce is something very easy. As soon as there is an argument, you're walking out of your house, you've had an argument, and you see bulletin boards. Do you want a divorce? Call this number. And you say, okay, I'm going to ignore that. You look at the bus, and it says, do you want a divorce? Call this number. And as soon as you call the number, what are they going to do? Send you a couple of papers, you sign them, marriage is over, you're divorced. And of course, for the ladies, they make money. So it's, it's easier than other countries, but it's also not something that we should take lightly. In a state like California or New York, divorce rate is up to 60 to 70 percent. So you literally don't have any marriages that last. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. You see, marriage is the most honorable union within the Islamic ideology. It's the most sacred union within the religion of Islam. Listen to this. Listen to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As-salat amududdin. Prayers is the pillar of your faith, okay? And then there is a special reward in fasting. There is a special reward in going to hajj. There is a special reward for doing amr bil ma'roof, nahi an al-munkar. However, when it comes to marriage, what does Rasulullah say? Man tazawwaja faqad ahraza nisf Whoever gets married, ensures half of their faith, half of their faith, is ensured by marriage. Al-Imam al-Sadiq, Al-Imam al-Baqir have stated rak'atan, rak'atan, two rak'ats of salah, rak'atan yusallihima mutazawwaj, afdalu inda Allah min sab'ina rak'ah yusalliha a'zab. Two rak'ah of prayers by a married individual is multiplied by 70 if it comes from a single individual. So if a single person needs to pray 70 times more to reach the prayer of a married individual. So it's a great deed. It's a great deed. Some people are saying, I don't want the 70. I'll just... I don't know if people get my jokes here. I'm actually really disappointed. I really have to work on some new jokes. Anyhow, 
So, it's a great deed of worship. It's a blessed act of worship. It's not something that we take lightly. Now, let me ask you something. If you want to pray salah, what is the most important thing in your salah? What is it that if you don't have your salah is batil? What is it? Shunu. Ghar al wudu. Al niya. Who said niya? Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You guys also have very weak salawats. Are your parents not feeding you? So the knee is the most important and essential part of any act of worship. Let's say you stand and you pray a hundred rak'ah without a knee. You don't know what you're doing. You just say Allahu Akbar, you pray, ruku', sujood, but there's no knee. You're just doing it for the fun. You don't eat for 18 hours, but there is no knee of fasting. There is no knee of siyam. It doesn't count. You go to Hajj, but you don't have the niyyah for Hajj. It doesn't count. Therefore, the most important element in any act of worship is the niyyah. And if marriage has such a huge reward that it completes half of our faith, it also must need a niyyah. You have to have an intention. What is the intention? Some people think, that the niyyah for our a'mal is to say, for example, I pray two rak'ah of the morning prayers, qurbatan in Allah, Allahu Akbar. You really don't even need to say that. Niyyah means my intention to know what I'm doing. I basically have to know what I'm doing. I have to know that I need wudu for this prayer. I have to know that it's two rak'at. I have to know that I have to face the qibla. I have to know that I have to pray in such a method. I have to know that this is what's going to void my salah. This is how I'm going to start my salah. This is how I'm going to end my salah. So I have to know the do's and don'ts of prayer. I have to know the do's and don'ts of fasting. That's basically the niyyah. And I really don't have to utter anything. Same goes for marriage. I have to have the niyyah. Some people get into marriage and they don't know what's going on. They don't know why they're doing it. And that is why 70%, 60% of marriages end up in a divorce. So that is why I've decided to dedicate tonight's topic on this issue. To examine the Holy Quran and the input of the Holy Quran in regards to this matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا This is the first portion of our stop in tonight's examination of this verse. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he's put love and harmony amongst those who establish a family. The scholars of human behavior suggest That individuals, when they get married, obviously they're looking for intimacy. And intimacy is on four different levels. And people need to understand those levels. The first and the foremost, the first and foremost is intellectual intimacy. What do I mean by intellectual intimacy? You see, when we start our day, until we end our day, we're constantly going through different thoughts. Different thoughts come across our, our mind. We think of different things. We wake up, we kind of plan our day in our head. 
Then when we get to work or we get to school, we have different ideas. Then when we finish work, we get home, we have different ideas. We have different thoughts. And when we go home, we rarely share any of those ideas. We rarely share any of what we know. So for example, if you're a doctor, then you rarely share anything that you know, except when it's needed. If you're, let's say, a lawyer, then we rarely share what we know. If you're a Sayyid, like me, you know, you have to share what you know because either way, people are going to hear it from the mimbar or elsewhere. But the idea is conversing with the family members. The idea is conversing with the special someone, sharing our minds. And that's very important. That's very important. That's why scholars of human behavior suggest that people that we work with tend to know us more than individuals whom we live with. So sometimes a person that works for works for me or with me will probably know me more than my spouse because we spend eight, nine hours together and we're constantly sharing ideas. Second level of intimacy is emotional intimacy. We have to share our emotions. After every thought, there isn't an emotion. What is it that makes us happy? What is it that makes us sad? What is it that makes us angry? What is it that disappoints me? What is it that encourages me? Those are different feelings. And I, I need to share those feelings so that I can have a healthy relationship. So that I can have a healthy marriage. If I don't share them, if I don't tell you what's going to upset me, how would you know what's going to upset me? You'd have to go through the hard way of finding out. If I don't share with you what's going to make me happy, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to take time for us to get to know one another so I find out what makes you happy, what makes you sad, what makes you upset. And sharing our emotions is part of the emotional intimacy, sharing, sharing our mind and our hearts. Then comes the spiritual intimacy. Especially... For the Muslim families, where we spend some time together during the 24 hours, possibly praying together, supplicating together, going to Hajj together, going to Umrah together, going to a Ziyarah trip together, reciting a verse from the Holy Quran, reciting a passage from Nahj al Balagha, looking at different hadiths, all those are part of the spiritual experience, spiritual intimacy. Then comes what? The social intimacy. During the day, we meet so many people. We converse with so many people. We make so many friends. And one area where I see a lot of problems occurring within marriages is the social boundaries. So for example, let's say I have a, a Facebook, Twitter, and all those things. And I get married, and I'm, le I'm leading the same social life that I had. I have certain friends, I have certain circle of friends, I go out with certain people, I hang out with certain people. And my significant other doesn't appreciate, for example, half of my social life. Those are things that are important. They truly create problems. And in the same time, if you're able to understand them, and if you're able to come to an agreement in their regards, it solves many of the problems. And then comes the physical intimacy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أزواجاً لتسكنوا إليها so that you may have intimacy with one another and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to all segments of intimacy 
And then he says, after this part is secured, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً If you do this, <coughs> if you do this, there is automatically going to be mawaddah and rahmah. What is mawaddah and what is rahmah? Mawaddah is when we illustrate and we demonstrate our love. And when we illustrate and when we demonstrate our love for one another, there is automatically going to be mercy and compassion within the family. Because believe me, some families there is no mercy. There is no compassion. There is no forgiveness. There is no tolerance. It's like boot camp. You feel that I, I don't have any sort of peace in this home. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says first, if you look at the list of different types of intimacy, and then you look at the different languages of love to illustrate your love, then there's going to be compassion and mercy in that household. What do I mean? This is very important, a delicate point that inshallah every one of you will enjoy and take home with you tonight. Scholars of human behavior all agree that human beings have different languages of love. We all want to be loved but our languages of love are different from one another. We don't all speak the same languages of love or language of love. What do I mean? For example, many of you have probably heard, people come to me that you've heard, the woman comes, the wife comes, she says, say it. The house is always clean. The food's on the table. The kids are, you know, taken care of. Everything that he wants, I've, I've made. The food, the shirts are ironed, the house is cleaned. What, what else does he want? What else does he ask me for? And then the husband comes, he says, Say it, I work from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Every year we take five vacations. Every year she changes her car. She has a credit card. I take care of the house. I buy the best clothes for them. I take them to... Uh, the restaurants every weekend. I spend so much time. I work like a dog. And she doesn't appreciate me. Do you see that they both think that they're actually showing their love to one another, but this is not what the other guy wants. This is not what the husband wants. He says, you know what? I'd rather just eat anything. I want you to communicate to me in my language of love. Yes, some people... Their language of love could be through their stomach. Some, very few. No. <sighs> Hajjah, we're going to have a hard time now. Because the whole lecture is going to get affected. <laughs> yes, of course, no one wants to stay hungry. But the difference is, no. And then the, man, the woman, the woman, she says, Sayyid, I don't want him to work 12 hours a day. I don't want him to work 16 hours a day. But he thinks that this is how he's showing his love to his wife and children. So enough said, I think that we all agree on this point. What are the different lang love languages? What are they? There are four or five different love languages. I'm going to list every one of them. First love language is words of affirmation. Many people like to feel loved and feel the love coming from their father, mother, hu husband, wife, brother, friends through words of affirmation. Thumb something that we rarely, Middle Easterns, Easterners rarely do. Especially within the family. I'll give you an example. Let's say... You take your son, let's say, to a football game or soccer. So the father is watching his son and he's like, oh man, he, this guy's never getting the ball. And his son sits in the car, he's driving him home, and he says to him, son, why, why are you playing basketball? So he says, dad, I like basketball. I think I'm good at it. <laughs> are you kidding me? You're good at it? 
You never even had the ball. You know how hurtful that is? That's very hurtful. We don't watch what we say sometimes. Or let's say his wife has cooked a meal. She thinks it tastes good, but it doesn't. So we, as soon as we take the first bite, or it doesn't have to be the husband, it could be one of the children. Oh, mom. I'm going to be looking at this side saying this. Oh, mom, what is this? It's so salty. God, I can't eat it. And I'm going to order pizza. That's hurtful. Moms get upset. And it's definitely not going to show our love. Or let's say your husband's a teacher. Let's say that... He's a teacher that, yeah, kids don't like him. And we tell him, you know what? Yeah, all those kids, they, they don't like you. You're, you're a terrible teacher. That's probably not the best way to show our love. Instead, what we can do is tell, you know, the mom, the wife, whoever is in the house cooking, even if it doesn't taste the best, we make them feel it's the best. We say, you know, this food was amazing. Thank you. It just takes two words, three words. Words of affirmation. It shows our love. Or let's say your son, he really doesn't know how to play basketball. But you tell him, son, you know, you were really good out there. I really think that you should continue to play basketball. Believe me, he's not going to continue a professional career if you tell him that. But it makes him feel special. It makes him feel that what he's doing is good at what he's doing. But if I always tell him, you don't know how to do this, you don't know how to play this, you don't... He's always going to feel that he has, he's missing something. And at work, he's going to feel the same way. At school, he's going to feel the same way. At home, he's going to feel the same way. When he gets married, he's going to feel the same way. Let's not put that in our children. It's a disease. Or let's say your husband is a teacher, he's a driver, he's a doctor. Whatever he is. And even if he's not so good at it, tell him you're the best teacher. Tell him you're the best engineer. Tell him, you know, you're the best husband, you're the best father. Words of affirmation. And where do we find this? We find this in the language of Ahl al-Bayt. Look at Hadith al-Kisa. Many of us recite Hadith al-Kisa, but we don't ponder on Hadith al-Kisa. Imam Hassan comes in, Rasulullah comes in, he speaks to his daughter Fatima, he says, As-salamu alayki ya binta Rasulullah. He says to his own daughter, Rasulullah kisses the hand of his daughter, he appreciates his daughter, look at how Imam Ali speaks to his wife. As-salamu alayki ya binta Rasulullah, inni ashummu indaki ra'ihatan tayyibah. She responds, وَعَلَيْكَ السَّلَامُ يَا أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِنَّهُ نَعَمْ هَا هُنَا تَحْتَ الْكِسَاء Imam Hussein comes, يَا أُمَّاه يَا بِنْتَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ إِنِّي أَشُمُّ عُنْدَكِ رَائِحَةً طَيِّبَةً When he speaks to his grandfather, السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكَ يَا مَنْ اِخْتَارَهُ اللَّهِ Imam Rasulullah responds to his grandson, to his young boy, the three, four-year-old son, Imam Hussein, وَعَلَيْكَ السَّلَامُ يَا بُنَيَّ وَيَا ثَمَرَةَ فُعَادِي وَيَا شَافِعَ أُمَّتِي إِنَّهُ نَعَمْ قَدْ أَذِنْتُ Look at the language, look at the beauty of conversing with one another. Look at the respect, look at the words of affirmation. It, may, it plays a role. Have you seen some people when they talk on the phone? Before they hang up, what do they say? Huh? What do they say? Some people say, I love you. So fast, it doesn't, it has no meaning. Wallah, it has no meaning. I'd rather just not say it. Imam Ali calls Imam Hassan and he says to him, Bunayya Hassan, come. He sits him down. He says, Bunayya Hassan, wajadtuka ba'di. I found you to be part of me. Then he says, La wallah, bal wajadtuka kulli. No, I found you to be all of my existence. Bal wajadtuka kulli, hatta idha shay'an asabaka asabani. Every time you're hurt, 
Every time you're down, I'm hurt. I'm down. This is how we show our love. We sit down and we speak about our love, our feelings, our emotions. So first, some people like to feel loved through words of affirmation. Number two, spending quality time. Some people, they don't feel loved unless you spend time with them. They're eager for your time. They're eager for your attention. And a lot of fathers especially don't spend time with their families. America has made the home into a bed and breakfast. You come in, you eat, you shower, you leave. However, the members of the family, they need your time and your attention. So some people, some fathers especially, say, say it, I spend time with my kids, we go to the, uh, the mall. We go to the movies. We go to uh, the, uh, the restaurant during the weekends. That's not called spending quality time. That's called spending time in close proximity. And there's a difference. When I spend time in close proximity with someone, I'm not giving them their attention. They're just there, we're watching a movie. They're there, we're eating. They're there, we're shopping. Quality time is when I give my undivided attention to this person. That's going to make them feel loved. Number three, acts of service. Some people feel loved when you take care of something for them. When you run an errand for them. You give them some time to show them an act of service. It shows them that you love them. And of course, in the Middle East, Middle Eastern parents always want their children to serve them. It's a given. Take out the trash, clean the house, wash the dishes, what else? Do the laundry, iron my shirt, feed me. It's good. We have to serve our parents. We have to love our parents. Allah emphasizes on this issue. But once every blue moon, oh parent! Do something for your children. Besides working and bringing money and you know, the actual, no, something that they recognize. They see, they say, oh my father, he took some time to for example, help me in my application for my school. That's an act of service. My mother, she took some time to for example, help me and teach me learn how to recite the Quran. This is an act of service. And especially within the house, between the husband and the wife, it's okay for the husband sometimes to wash the dishes, to clean the house, to, sometimes I said, to vacuum, this is okay. And the same thing goes for the wife, if she can help her husband in different ways, it's fine. Acts of service. The last way of showing our love of course it's not maybe some people have two diff two lo love languages maybe some of them need to see the three maybe some of them need to see all four but we have a primary love language last but not least is receiving gifts some people when they receive gifts they feel loved and I'm one of them so some people think that you know, you have to buy big gifts and spend thousands of dollars. And have you seen, believe me, I'm not saying this uh, in a joking way, but if someone forgets my birthday, I really don't care. It doesn't matter to me. But have you seen how upset some people get if you forget their birthday? They really get upset. It's probably because, you know, receiving gifts is their primary love language. They've waited a whole year for that day. They don't want you to forget that day. So people have different... So it's, even if it's a small gift, believe me, sometimes I go to different places. And once again, I'm not saying this, so you hear and you do the same thing. But they write me a small card. And believe me, it goes such a long way. I read it sometimes. And I feel that this person 
even though it's probably cost them two dollars but this person truly showed me appreciation truly they took out the time they did this it shows appreciation and I have felt this with my teachers as well sometimes when you travel and they know you have suitcases and you didn't have time to shop but you buy them something small and you take it to them they realize that in, just, in this journey my student was thinking of me he didn't forget me and it shows our love and with this I conclude that the same applies to our relationship with Allah with the words of affirmation we recite the dua and we speak to Allah and we tell him that we love him and we appreciate him and with quality time we go to Hajj or for example we spend the night prayers and with acts of service we volunteer our time with receiving gifts, we depart from our wealth and we give towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we have to learn from in the month of Ramadan, the month of change, the month of Allah. We have to first and foremost change our families, change our relationship within the home, within our friends, within our community members and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are in need of both of them. A believer, a mu'min needs those two wings. If you have a good relationship with Allah, but you don't have a good relationship with your family, what good does it do? What good is that going to do for you? Or if you have a perfect relationship with your family, but you don't have a relationship with Allah, what good is that going to do for you? We need both. And this is the month where we spend time to achieve both of them, inshallah and to bring joy and satisfaction and tranquility and peace to our homes and our lives and our entire existence. Let us raise our hands to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The nights of Ramadan are passing very fast. And soon you're going to see that the half of the month is gone and then the whole month is gone. Make sure that you discipline yourself from the beginning of not procrastinating going to Allah and asking forgiveness and reciting the Qur'an and reading the dua. We start from the early days of the month of Ramadan. And let us take some time, we spend some time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believe me. It's the best thing, He's the best friend to spend time with. Inshallah, I'm going to speak about that tomorrow. Let us raise our hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask you Allahumma wa ned'uka bismika al-azim al-a'zam al-a'az al-ajal al-akram ten times with the loudest of our voices Ya Allah Ya Allah Ya Allah يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم اللهم إنا نسألك ونقسم عليك بأحب الخلق إليك محمد وآل محمد أن تصلي على محمد وآل محمد O oh Allah, every man and every woman present in this majlis with a sin, forgive our sins. Shower unto us from your forgiveness. O oh Allah, every man and every woman present in this majlis with an illness, give them cure. O oh Allah, every man and every woman present in this majlis, write our names. Amongst those Hujjaj Baytik Al Haram. O oh Allah, give us the honor and the privilege of reciting the Holy Quran in this month, of understanding the Holy Quran. O oh Allah, allow the Quran to be our interceder in the day of our need. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. وترحم وتحنن وتلطف على محمد وآل محمد 
كما صليت وباركت وترحمت وتحننت وتلطفت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم عجل ثم عجل لمولانا الفرج اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات Brothers, sisters, I'm telling you this every day. We keep our hands up to Allah and we say Ameen for Allah to accept the dua. اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وتجاوز عنا واغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا واجزيهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات عفوا وغفرانا وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات الفاتحة مع الصلوات